Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming here. Um, many of you we know, a couple of new faces. Welcome to everyone. My name is Penny Wright. Um, and I have to say, one thing I meant to do today was actually do a complete count of how many times Fred Volkmer has been at this library speaking. And I forgot to do it. But I think he started maybe speaking here maybe around 2003. And he's been here about 20 times, maybe 21. So Fred does get the, the sticker, the gold star. And I'm sure many of you know Fred, but for those of you who don't, um, I'll tell you a few things. He started writing for the Southampton Press in 1983, has written book, art, art theater, and music reviews. In addition, his work has appeared in Newsday, the East Hampton Star, the New York Sun, the Christian Science Monitor, and the Wall Street Journal. His work has been praised by William F. Buckley, who said that he is a reviewer to watch, and by Sidney Offit, the curator of the James Polk Journalism Awards. Barbara Wurzba, uh, the novelist and writer of children's books who, had a long, who was a longtime reviewer for the New York Times Book Review, said of him that he was one of the best reviewers writing today. Roger Rosenblatt and Louis Begley have praised his acuity and sensitivity, and the novelist Frederick Tutton thanked Fred for one of his reviews with these words. I can't thank you enough for your thoughtful, beautifully written, and insightful review of my The Green Hour. It touched me very much and made me feel, how shall I say, understood, and thus less lonely. Fred is a member of the National Book Critics Circle. He's also a singer, recently retired from the Choral Society of the Hamptons, but a lifelong lover of music. Please welcome Fred Volkman. speaks volumes about the man. 
Robert Byron lost his life at sea two days before his 36th birthday in February of 1941, when the ship he was on was torpedoed by a German U-boat. His biographer, James Knox, describes the sense of loss felt by his friends and family. I can't believe that Robert isn't in the world anymore, said one of his oldest friends, Nancy Mifford. It doesn't seem reasonable. Many years later, she admitted to her sister, Jessica, that I would have liked to marry Robert. Disappointment still lingered in the explanation that followed, but he was a total pederast. They settled for a deep, uncomplicated friendship. Nancy testified to their closeness when she wrote some years after his death, I found it almost impossible to convey to people who didn't know him what absolute heaven he was. I've never known anyone so complex. Even his physical appearance was entirely unlike his character. Reflecting upon him to another friend, she wrote, I think of all the dead except relations, I miss Robert the most. It's the jokes. Michael Ross consoled Robert's mother with the thought that his will to live was so strong that I am convinced that he found uh, that he found some means of escape. Robert's vitality was legendary, engaging him in an array of pursuits, any one of which would have satisfied most individuals. He was at the forefront of the reappreciation of Byzantine civilization. <clears throat> he was an adventurous traveler with numerous books to his name. He was a crusader in the battle to save George and London from the real estate developers. He stood out against fascism and appeasement long before others saw the danger. And on the outbreak of war, he threw himself into politics, arguing for the creation of a union of states to preserve world peace after Germany's defeat. Not surprisingly, when official confirmation of his death was finally received, another close friend, Rand Antrim, compared his loss to that of the intellectual giants who were destroyed in the flower of their youth in the First World War. Byron's legacy as a traveler had already taken hold in his lifetime. His book, The Station, led one youthful admirer, Patrick Lee Fermor, to undertake a pilgrimage to Mount Athos. For good measure, <coughs> Lee Fermor set off equipped with a rucksack, which, uh, which <coughs> which belonged to Mark Ogilvy Grant, a member of Byron's party in 1927. He had taken to what the Greeks call the Holy Mountain. Lee Fermo, whose three incandescent volumes of travel autobiography, described his walk across, described his walk across Europe, acknowledged that the station altered my whole itinerary, and one thing leading to another, perhaps in the course of a lifetime. Obviously, that was under his spell, and still am. Byron makes an appearance in various memoirs of the period. He memoirs a little learning, Harold Atkins' memoirs of an aesthete, and a few autobiographical volumes by Anthony Cole, but he was not a household name in the United States. His revival here, however, is due to a book by the American critic and historian Paul Fussell. <coughs> His praise of Byron is enthusiastic, especially for the road to Oxiana, which he describes in one inspired sentence. Its distinction tempts one to overpraise, but perhaps it may not be gone too far to say that what Ulysses is to the novel between the wars, and what the wasteland is to poetry, the road to Oxiana is, is to the tragic. Byron's career is tragically brief. Uh, only 15 years, yet in that 15 years he achieved an astonishing amount. He was a courageous traveler, an incredibly erudite uh, amateur historian, and a writer of breathtaking prose. All this in spite of an undistinguished academic <coughs> career and a youth spending on the right young things of Oxford and Mayfair. As a young man, he was a party goer, a country house chatterer, a belligerent controversialist who would rather die than be seen agreeing with conventional opinion. Nancy Mitford wrote after spending a weekend with him, isn't Robert just killing? He seems to hate everything which ordinary people like. Byron was a member of the lower upper classes. 
His father was perpetually short of cash, but his grandfather's wealth enabled Byron to attend Eton and Merton College, Oxford. It was at Eton that most of, his, most of Byron's friendships were made. His taste was formed there, and it was there he recalled, I discovered I'd lose my mind. These words were written, were written in 1938, just after the Germans had marched into Vienna, when Robert was filled with an intimation of his mortality. In view of this, he judged Eaton to have bestowed upon him the advantages of adulthood at an unusually early age. This, he realized, had brought him two extra years of real education, a long release of my own faculties. <clears throat> after being sent down from Oxford, he would say, we would say, expelled. Byron and two friends, Alfred Duggan and Gavin Henderson, went on a car trip from England to Greece and the Balkans, passing through Italy and Germany. It was in Bologna that he had his first encounter with fascism when he met a man called Rossi, head of the fascisti of Ferrara, who filled him with overpower overpowering revulsion. Byron kept a journal during the trip, and it was the basis from which he shaped his first book, Europe and the Looking Glass, Reflections of a Motor Drive from Grimsby to Athens. Published when he was 21, it is unquestionably, unquestionably a young man's book, full of high spirits and hijinks. But it is also a sharply observed view of Europe and the 20s, often gracefully written. Byron harbored a particularly schoolboy prejudice against classical Greece. He found the sculptures bland and boring, the architecture repetitive. In his first letter home, he wrote, ancient Greece, so far, so far we have been spared. <coughs> but even he was overwhelmed by the magnificence of the Parthenon. His biographer says he could scarcely believe his eyes, so different was the reality <coughs> from the familiar photographic image. Climbing up the rough marble steps through the pillared archway of the Probalia gateway, he was confronted by a scene of infinite beauty. He says of it, strewn in all directions with rocks of white marble, gleaming in the brilliant sunlight, the broken sides displaying the oldest and at the same time the most modern architectural conventions, varied with now and then a fragmentary bar relief, the hindquarters of a horse a human arm or a draped hip, and at the top rising from its massive double base, there stood the Parthenon, its pillars, Doric, plain, massive, and fluted against the brazen turquoise of the sky behind. In this set piece description composed for publication, Byron pitted his pen against the lens of the Victorian photographer. Their dreary prints, prints hung in schools across the land, accentuating every scratch and chip, where he argued, responsible for the loathing with which the very thought of a Greek ruin fills the mind of any educated person. But it was to Greece that he returned after being sent down from Oxford. He and a friend, David Talbot Rice, hatched a plan to visit Mount Athos with the purpose of preparing an illustrated book on the extraordinary frescoes. His publisher agreed to the venture with the proviso that the book should be in a light-hearted vein, like his first book. They agreed, and Rice would take the pictures, and Byron would provide the text. Mount Athos is an important center of Eastern Orthodox monastic life. It is the home of 20 monasteries, and has had a continuous Christian presence for almost 1,800 years. The Orthodox call it the Holy Mountain. Women are not allowed in order to make living in celibacy easier for those men who wish to do so. Even female livestock are not allowed. <laughs> it's, it is the home of countless artworks, manuscripts, and icons. Byron was overwhelmed by the beauty of its artifacts and its churches. His biographer describes Byron's response to Simo Pedro, one of the churches of the Holy Mountain. Robert's intuition, specifically his eye for architecture, was set alight by Simo Pedro. Determined to make a drawing, he slithered down a mountain path to the foot of the monastery. The impact of the building thrilled him to the core. 
I pencil, he wrote, prone to the romantic, flat over the page in ecstasy, exaggerating the tone of the sky to the ferocity of the thunderstorm. His word picture, touched up slightly for publication, was no less arresting. Far above, a huge tinted box, cream gold, and striped with the shadowed silver of oaken struts and planks, was rocketed to the blazing turquoise sky. It lived like the flowers of the mystic. It sang, insensate, irresistible, inexplicable. Rarely moved by the church services of the holy mountain, the vision of Simo Petra was for him a religious experience. The building had challenged all his gifts. It had stirred his intellectual curiosity, inspired him as an artist, and brought forth his voice sonorous, speculative, and passionate as an architectural critic. His other great love, landscape, was also lauded in his hymn of praise. The psychological link between man's creation and God's earth was, in Robert's mind, indissoluble. It was to be a guiding light on his travels and a key to his unlocking of the great creative genius of civilization. Prior to Byron's brilliant evocations of Byzantine art, the attitude was much like this of the historian W.E.B.H. Lecky. Of the Byzantine, Byzantine Empire, the universal verdict of history is that it constitutes, with scarcely an exception, the most thoroughly base and despicable form that civilization has yet assumed. There has been no other enduring civilization so absolutely destitute of all the forms and elements of greatness, and none of which the epithet, epithet mean is so emphatically be applied. It was Byron's habit at the end of the day, after a grueling trip by mule to one monastery or another, to go swimming. This horrified the monks who warned him of sharks. He asked one of the monks if sharks were prevalent in the area, to which the monk replied, Yes, 250 years ago, a monk was attacked. <laughs> when they caught the shark, they found the monk in one piece inside the shark's stomach. Byron disavowed any pretensions to scholarship. My object, he said, in the Byzantine achievement is not to advance scholarship, but general appreciation of things Byzantine. Nevertheless, even such authorities as Stephen Runciman were impressed by his work. James Knox said, writing the Byzantine achievement has, had given Robert the education that Oxford had failed to deliver. In one chapter alone on Byzantine civilization, he touches upon the spread of Mithraism, a Persian rival to Christianity, the spiritual roots of Judaism, the impact of Alexander the Great's sculptures upon the Buddhist carvers of northern India, and the early Iranian influence upon, Arme upon the Armenian church architecture. The geographical scope of his subject is conveyed in his description of the commerce of Constantinople. From every degree of, of the compass came the caravans and fleets. From India came pepper and musk. From Persia, sugar. And before the eruption of the Mongol races beyond the Oxus, porcelain from China, and glass from Mesopotamia. Yet the one book with which we associate Byron, the one book without which all others are footnotes to English literature, is the road to Oxiana. It stands by itself, unique among the literary works of the 20th century. For Patrick Lee Farmer, judged by many, including me, to be the greatest travel writer of all time, the road to Oxiana is the greatest travel book. For Bruce Chapman, himself an outstanding writer of travel books, it is a sacred text and he had a copy on his, in his pocket at all times. There is no other book quite like it. It is written in the form of a diary, and thus has an immediacy that one doesn't experience in a regular narrative. Paul Fossil insisted that it was meticulously edited over a long period, carefully shaped to seem more like a diary than it actually was, and that it was as much a work of fiction as it was a record of events. This opinion is based on the testimony of Christopher Sykes, who accompanied Byron for most of the journey. James Knox, Byron's biographer, is of the opinion that the diary was barely edited at all. 
and I find you agree with Sykes, is there was a three-year gap in publication before the appearance of the road to Oxiana. The book recounts a journey from Venice through the Middle East via Beirut, Jerusalem, Baghdad, and Tehran to Oxiana, the country of the Oxus, which is the ancient name of the river Amu Darya, and which forms part of the border between Afghanistan and what, what was the Soviet Union. It is quite simply a very funny book with a cast of characters that might have, ever, might have emerged from the pages of Dickens had Dickens written about the Middle East. There are discourses on history, lyrical descriptions of landscape and architecture, small comic playlets, and the occasional mock opera fragments complete with dynamic markings from pianissimo to fortissimo. And then there are descriptions of the physical ordeals of travel in itself. Byron traveled by foot, by car, and truck, by horse and mule, uh, through snow and mud, crossing rivers, mountains, and deserts. It is quite extraordinary that he had the physical ability to carry it off. Unlike the athletic Patrick de Fermor, he had the physique of a pudding. <laughs> he looked remarkably like Queen Victoria and the semblance which delighted him. Some of the conversations he records, which might or might not be true, would not be out of place at the Bad Hatter's Tea Party. I quote, Persia resembles an algebraical equation. It may or may not come out. I gave all yesterday to it, and we, and we go off at six this morning, but have spent the rest of the day here awaiting cavalry and horses. There are two kinds of police, the Nazmiya, which controls the towns, and the Omnia, which controls the roads and such of the hinterland as admits the law. On the advice of the chief of the Nazmiya, I called on the chief of the Amnia, since his men must be responsible for my journey to Firuzabad. He was a fat, jocular fellow and was anxious to help me. <coughs> the governor had already telephoned to him, explaining my purpose and identity. His first act, therefore, was to telephone to the governor, inquiring my purpose and identity. Having received a satisfactory answer, he bethought himself, and the governor concurred that the matter would be simplified if the governor were to set forth my purpose and identity in the letter. Before going to fetch the letter, I asked him if I ought to have an escort, since there were rumors of thieves on the road. <coughs> quite unnecessary, he replied, quite unnecessary. Hurrying out of cab to the ark, I rattled off the polite formulas, complimented the governor on his orange trees, and asked if the letter was ready. Don't you think, he said pensively, that you ought to have an escort for the journey? <laughs> really, your excellency must advise me on that, on that point. The race, the Omnia, says it is unnecessary. I will telephone to him. Certainly, answered the race, the race, the Omnia, over the wire. Certainly, he must have an escort. He can't possibly go without it. But there was a difficulty. The local finance minister had just started on a tour of travel assessment to include, among other things, the property of the Kaban al Mulk, apparently the Ira Renet of Persia, and had taken 100 mounted, mounted guards with him. Thus, there were no horses left, and any escort with, with me would have to go on foot. <coughs> In that case, I said, let me hire horses for them. The governor and the race of thought this was an excellent solution. Meanwhile, the secretary in the next room was writing the governor's letter to the race Iamnia. When the governor had approved it, a fair copy was made. This he signed and sealed and handed to me. I jumped into the cab and was back at the Iamnia within two hours of leaving. Do you think, perhaps, asked the race, the enemy had landed, that you ought to have an escort to take to Jerusalem? <laughs> really, your eminence must advise me on that point. In my opinion, you ought. Will one man be enough? 
And certainly, I'm not a millionaire to hire, to hire horses for the truth. Of course not. Who is? Five men will be enough. It will be enough, I imagine. Naturally, they will all be mounted on government horses. We have plenty of spare. And it may facilitate matters that you take an officer with you in the car as far as Cabo. <coughs> he will arrange your own horses there. I will tell him to call on you at the hotel at 5 o'clock to arrange things. Your eminence is too kind. Could you come at 8 instead of 5 as I am going out to tea? Dress as you wish. I will tell him to come at 7. <laughs> the Byron was untroubled by the perils of his trip, even, even, and, and they were many, not only physical, I wish all of his forms of transportation broke down at one time or another, but also the political. Crossing into Persia, his companion Sykes nervously rebukes him for disrespecting the Shah out loud. He suggests, call him Mr. Smith. I always call him Mussolini, Mr. Smith, isn't he? Well, Mr. Brown. No, that's Stalin's name in Russia. <coughs> Further debate establishes that Jones is no good either. That's what Byron calls Hitler in Germany. Eventually, the two travelers settle on marchbanks for the shop. Byron was as daring as he was witty. To enter the forbidden mosque of Golashad, he disguised himself by blackening his face with charcoal. From Herat to Mazar Sharif, he and Sykes, and Sykes were the first Englishman to undertake what was and remains a highly dangerous route. Byron was strikingly joyous, in spite of any hardships he encountered. And something of that joy is captured in prose of which this excerpt describing the sunset at the shrine of Niamatua is a small example. While the cadent sun runs down, very copper streaks from the, across the sand blown sky, all the birds of Persia have gathered for a last chorus. Slowly the darkness brings silence and they settle themselves to speak with diminishing flutterings, as of a child arranging its bedclothes. One could quote him endlessly. After completing the road to Oxiana, Byron visited Russia in the infancy of Stalin's regime, before the Great Terror, where he was fascinated and repelled by the oppressive atmosphere. He also went to Germany, where he attended the last Nuremberg rally in 1938 as a journalist, and was equally horrified. He was the guest of Unity Mitford, the Mitford sister who was in love with him. <laughs> On his return, he threw himself into politics. He weighed in against the accusers and even went beyond the possibility of war to suggest an international organization like the League of Nations. Byron tried to join the Royal Naval Volunteers Supplementary Reserve, but was turned down. Next, he offered his services to the War Office as a propagandist. He then decided to join the European News Department at the BBC. Ultimately, he was hired as a roving foreign correspondent for the Sunday Times. He would cover the entire Middle East and part of Russia. In addition, for the government, he was required to keep tabs on any activity by the Russians in that area. He was on the boat to Cairo to begin his new job. Thank you. Um, 
but many, many others. I mean, even Ward wrote many travel books, and so did Grant Green, and so did uh, uh, whoever else. Uh, Somerset Maugham, yes, that's right. Yeah. Yes. The Wander Shores of Love. The Wander Shores of Love. No, all the women. All the women that explores. All the women explores. Who went into the middle I was just going to ask you, was that first one that you recommended that was equally interesting? The writer, was it Chapman? No. That was Patrick. Can I hear you for a moment? Yeah. How do you spell the last name? F-E-R-M-O-R. I noticed they seem to be making a film out of the um, Gertrude Bell adventure. Yes. Desert Queen, although they've given it a different name. They also made a film about uh, Patrick Lee Furmore. Uh, uh, and his, his uh, kidnapping <coughs> of the uh, German commandant on the island of Crete. Uh, really? Yeah. Dirk Bogart. Dirk Bogart. Dirk Bogart. It's a terrible movie. It's a terrible movie. That's a really good one. But Pratt and Furmore wrote the script. And he has a cameo appearance. He, he, he rushes out and say, say, I think it was something like the Germans are coming, the Germans are coming. <laughs> 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 was he alone? I beg your pardon? Was he alone? Or was he with society? Uh, who was his son? Uh, Byron. 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 Uh, no, he was he, he he had a tremendous terrific social life. He was gay and did not have good um, and a lot of his associations were gay. But he did not uh, he didn't shrink from society. Uh, he, as, as often as he offended people, he made them laugh. And uh, even though he was already a daughter, but for some reason he liked to do this. But he was he was fascinated by by architecture and uh, particularly Byz Byzantine architecture and, and uh, uh, Turkish architecture, and uh, that was his principal interest. But anyway, it's, it's quite it's quite a good book. Fred, how did the how did the language the, the, all those guys seem to be very adept? Learning other, you know, language, very difficult language. Well, uh, Christopher Sykes said that, that uh, Byron didn't speak a word of anything, and all of the <laughs> all of the all of the, uh, the dialogue in his books was completely invented. <laughs> he said it was more fiction, more fiction than, than <laughs> but, but quite convincing. Yeah. Are his books in French? Uh, a lot, a lot of them. Uh, certainly, uh, uh, yeah, certainly uh, this this one is, and uh, uh, the station is in print, and the uh, book about a trip across uh, through Europe is in print. It was his first book written when he was 21 years old, um, and uh, yeah, the station, and he wrote a book about Russia and uh, Russia, India, and. And they are all they are all here. But some of the earlier, some of the I don't have a list in front of me, but some of the others that are in England. It came out in the, the soft the paperback came out in the early eighties. Yes, well the uh, that's, that's when he was rediscovered. Uh, when uh, fossil uh, wrote the wrong. Was it fossil? I'm sorry. It was fossil. Yeah, yeah fossil. Yeah. Yeah. Now, did his books sustain him, or did his grandfather continue to support him? No, his, his, uh, he, was, he was constantly in debt. So uh, his grandfather supported him? No, the grandfather didn't support him. You mentioned he did. He, got, he allowed him to, to, uh, to get into uh, uh, Eton and Oxford. Uh, his record was, and Oxford was undistinguished. Uh, but his father, I mean, his grandfather ultimately died, and I think the inland revenue, or what they call the inland 
general revenue service took most of his money. And did you say what he was sold his? I'm sorry. Okay. So, um, how did he support himself going through these? He was a, journal he was a, he was a journalist. He wrote, uh, he wrote uh, uh, articles. And all, all the places he went to, he wrote articles about them for various newspapers. And they just about covered his expenses. It was interesting you were distinguishing Cambridge and, Univers uh, Cambridge and Oxford. Yes. The interests of those uh, students were quite Quite Thank you. Thank you all for coming.